Chapter 12, Part 1 of A History of Greece to the Death of Alexander the Great, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dick Durrett. A History of Greece to the Death of Alexander the Great, Volume 2, by John Bagnell Bury, Chapter 12, Part 1. The Spartan Supremacy and the Persian War. Sparta had achieved the task which she had been pressed to undertake, and had undertaken somewhat reluctantly the destruction of the Athenian Empire. It was a task which, though not imposed by the unanimous voice of Greece, appealed to a most deeply seated sentiment of the Greeks, their love of political independence. The Athenian Empire had been an outrage on that sentiment, and apart from all calculations of particular interest, the humiliation of the great offender must have been regarded even by those who were not her enemies, with an involuntary satisfaction. The avowed aim of Sparta throughout has been to restore their liberty to those states which had been enslaved by Athens and protect the liberty of those whom her ambition threatened. Now that this object was accomplished as fully as could be desired, it would have been correct for Sparta to retire into her old position, leaving the cities which had belonged to the Athenian Empire to arrange their own affairs if her deeds were to be in accordance with her profession. The alternative course for a state in the position of Sparta was to enter frankly upon the Athenian inheritance and pursue the aims and policy of Athens, as an imperial power. Other states might have adopted this course with advantage both to themselves and Greece. For Sparta it was impossible. And so, when Sparta, unable from the nature of her institutions and the character of her genius to tread in the footsteps of her fallen rival, nevertheless resolved to take under her own dominion the cities which had gone forth to deliver from all dominion, she not only cynically set aside her high moral professions, but entered on a path of ambition which led to calamity for herself and distress for Greece. The main feature of Greek history for the thirty years after Agos Postomy is Sparta's pursuit of a policy of aggrandizement beyond the Peloponnesus. The opposition which this policy calls forth leads both to the revival of Athens as a great power and to the rise of Thebes. In the end, Sparta is forced to retire into the purely Peloponnesian position for which her institutions fitted her. In the making of those institutions an activity beyond the Peloponnesus had not been contemplated, and they were too rigid to be adapted to the enlarged sphere of an Aegean dominion. Nothing short of a complete revolution in the Spartan state could have rendered her essay in empire a success, but the narrow Spartan system was too firmly based in the narrow Spartan character to suffer such a revolution. We may wonder how far the general who had placed his country in the position of arbitress of Greece appreciated the difficulty of reconciling the political character of Lacedaemon with the role of an imperial city. Unspartan as he was in many respects, Lysander had possibly more enlightened views as to the administration of an empire than his countrymen. A story is told that when Calibius the Spartan, Harmost of Athens, 
was knocked down by a young athlete whom he had insulted and appealed to Lysander, he was told that he did not know how to govern freemen. To deal with freemen abroad was what the average Spartan could not do, and it was such men as Calibius that Lysander had to use for the establishment of the empire which he had resolved to found. In each of the cities which had passed from Athenian into Spartan control, a government of members was set up, and its authority was maintained by a Lacedaemonian harmost with a Lacedaemonian garrison. The cities were thus given over to a twofold oppression. The foreign governors were rapacious and were practically free from home control, the native oligarchies were generally tyrannical and got rid of their political opponents by judicial murders, and both Descartes and Harmos played into each other's hands. Lysander exercised with a high hand and without far-sightedness the dictatorship which was his for the time and might at any hour be taken from him. He was solely concerned to impose a firm military despotism on the states which had been rescued from the Athenian confederacy. It is obvious that the Athenian and Spartan empires had little in common. They were, first of all, sharply contrasted through the fact that the Spartan policy was justified by no public object like that to which the confederacy owed its origin, and this contrast was all the more flagrant considering that after the battle of Agispotami there was the same demand for a pan-Hellenic confederacy with the object of protecting the Asiatic Greeks from Persia as they had been after the battle of Mycale. But so far from contracting her supremacy with such an object, Sparta had abandoned the Asiatic Greeks to the great king as a price of Persian help. Athens had won her power as a champion of the eastern Greeks. Sparta had secured her primacy by betraying them. In the second place, the method of the two states in exercising their power were totally different. The grievances against Athens, though real, were mainly of a sentimental nature. The worst Athens had done was to deprive some confederate cities of autonomy. There were no complaints of tyranny, rapine, or oppression. But under the Lacedaemonian supremacy, men suffered from positive acts of injustice and violence and might seek in vain at Sparta for redress. The spirit of the system which Lysander instituted may be judged from the statement that the will of any Spartan citizen was regarded as law in the subject states. The statement comes from a friend of Lacedaemon. The position of power which Lysander had attained in the eyes of the world and enjoyed without moderation could not fail to excite jealousy and apprehension at Sparta itself. He held a sort of royal court at Samos, and the Samians accorded him divine honors by calling after his name a feast which had hitherto been a feast of Hera. He was recalled to Sparta, and he obeyed the summons, bearing a letter from the satrap Phanabasus to justify him. But when it was opened, instead of being an encomium, it was found to be a deed of accusation, and Lysander was covered with ridicule as the victim of a Persian trick. He was permitted to escape from the situation on the plea of visiting the temple of Zeus Ammon in the Libyan oasis in accordance with a vow. But his work remained. Lacedaemon upheld her uncongenial military despotism, modifying Lysander's system only so far as not to insist on the maintenance of the Descartes, but to permit the cities to substitute other forms of government under the aegis 
of the Hamult. Financially, the empire was so constituted as to secure an income of a thousand talents to meet the expenses of Sparta in maintaining her system. The receipt of such an income was a political innovation, and its administration involved money transactions of a nature and on a scale which would have been severely condemned by Lycurgus. The admission into the treasury of a large sum of gold and silver, which had been brought to Sparta by Lysander, was a distinct breach of the Lycurgian discipline. Thus inflexible as the Spartan system was, the necessities of empire compelled it to yield at one point, and a point where attack is wont to be especially insidious. The supremacy of Sparta lasted for a generation, though with intervals in which it was not effective, and its history for more than half of the period is mainly determined by her relations with Persia. As it had been through Persia that she won her supremacy, so it was through Persia that she lost it, and through Persia that she once more regained it. End of chapter 12, part 1. Recording by Dick Durrett, Manchester, New Hampshire. Chapter 12, Part 2 of A History of Greece to the Death of Alexander the Great, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Graham Redman. A History of Greece to the Death of Alexander the Great, Volume 2 by John Bagnall Bury. Chapter 12, Part 2 The Rebellion of Cyrus and the March of the Ten Thousand We now come to an episode which takes us into the domestic history of Persia, out of the limits of Greek geography, into the heart of the Persian Empire. On the death of Darius, his eldest son Artaxerxes had succeeded to the throne, notwithstanding the plots of his mother Parisatis, who attempted to secure it for her younger and favourite son Cyrus. In these transactions Tissaphernes had supported Artaxerxes, and when Cyrus returned to his satrapy in Asia Minor, Tissaphernes was set to watch him. False suspicions and calumnies frequently lead to the actual perpetration of the crimes which they attribute, and perhaps if he had not been suspected, Cyrus would not have formed the plan of subverting his brother and seizing the kingship. But it is far more likely that from the first Cyrus had hoped and resolved to succeed to his father's throne. For his success he relied largely on an army of Greek mercenaries which he began to enlist. The revolutions which had passed over Greek cities in recent years, both in Asia and Europe, threw into the military market large numbers of strong men eager for employment and pay. They were recruited for the prince's service by Clearchus, a Spartan, who had held the post of Harmost, but had been repudiated and expelled by the ephors when he attempted to make himself tyrant of Byzantium like a new Pausanias. Moreover, the Lacedaemonian government, which owed much to Cyrus, was induced to support him secretly, and sent him, avowedly for another purpose, seven hundred hoplites. The army which Cyrus mustered when he set forth on his march to Susa amounted to one hundred thousand oriental troops, and about thirteen thousand Greeks, of which ten thousand six hundred were hoplites. The purpose of the march was at first carefully concealed from the troops, nor was the secret communicated to any of the officers except Clearchus. The hill tribes of Pisidia were often troublesome to Persian satraps, and their reduction furnished a convenient pretext. Among those who were induced by the prospect of high pay under the generous Persian prince 
to join this Pisidian campaign was Xenophon, an Athenian knight who was one of the pupils and companions of the philosopher Socrates. His famous history of the Anabasis, or upgoing of the Greeks with Cyrus, and their subsequent retreat, has rendered the expedition a household word. The charm of the Anabasis depends on the simple directness and fullness with which the story is told, and the great interest of the story consists in its breaking new ground. For the first time we are privileged to follow step by step a journey through the inner parts of Asia Minor into the heart of the Persian Empire beyond the Euphrates and the Tigris. There is a charm of actuality in the early chapters with their recurring phrases like brief entries in a diary. The day's marches from one city to another, the number of parasangs, and the lengths of the halts all duly set out. Hence Cyrus marches two stages, ten parasangs, to Pelti, an inhabited city, and here he remained three days. Setting forth from Sardis, Cyrus took the southeasterly road which led across the upper meander to the Phrygian Colossi, where he was joined by the troops of one of his Greek captains, the Thessalian Menon, and thence onward to Selene, where he awaited the arrival of Clearchus. So far the march had been straight to the ostensible destination, the country of Pisidia, but now Cyrus turned in the opposite direction, and, descending the meander, marched northward to Pelti and Ceremon Agora, or Potter's Mart, then eastward to the city called Caista Plain, close to the fort of Ipsus. Here the Greeks demanded their arrears of pay, and Cyrus had no money to satisfy them. But he was relieved from the difficulty, which might well have proved fatal to his enterprise, by the Cilician queen Epiaxa, wife of Cyanesis, who arrived well laden with money. Her coming must have been connected with private negotiations between Cyrus and the Cilician governor. As the route of Cyrus lay through Cilicia, a country barred on all sides by difficult passes, it was of the greatest moment for Cyrus to come to an understanding with the ruler, and on the other hand it was the policy of Cyanesis so to order his ways that whether Cyrus succeeded or failed, he might in either event be safe. As the plan of Cyrus was still a secret, it was a prudent policy to entrust the delicate negotiations to no one less safe than the queen. Having pacified the demands of his Greek mercenaries, Cyrus proceeded by Thimbrion and Tyreion to Iconium, and thence by the road, which describes a great southern curve through Lycaonia, to Tyana. The Greeks were allowed to plunder Lycaonia, a rough country with rough people, as they passed through it. The arrangement with Cyanesis seems to have been that he should make a display of resisting Cyrus, and Cyrus make a display of circumventing him. To carry out this arrangement, Menon's division, accompanied by the Queen Epiaxa, diverged from the route followed by the rest of the army, and crossed the Taurus into Cilicia by a shorter route. Perhaps they struck off at Barata, and passed by Laranda on a road that led to Soli. Thus Cyanesis, who, as a loyal servant of the great king, hastened to occupy the Cilician gates, the pass for which the main army of Cyrus was making, found himself taken in the rear by Menon. It was therefore useless to remain in the pass, and he retreated to a mountain stronghold. What more could a loyal servant of the great king be expected to do? The army of Cyrus, then coming up from Tyana by Pedandus, found the impregnable pass open, and descended safely to Tarsus, where it met Menon. The city and palace of the prince of Cilicia were pillaged. This, perhaps, was part of the pretense. It was at all events safe now for Cyanesis to enter into a contract with Cyrus, a compulsory contract, the great king would understand, to supply some money and men. It must have been dawning on the Greek troops for some time past, 
and at Tarsus they no longer felt any doubt that they had been deceived as to their ultimate destination. They had long ago passed Pisidia, the ostensible object of their march, and the true object was now clear to them. They flatly refused to advance further. It was a small thing to be asked to take the field against the forces of the great king, but it was no such light matter to be asked to undertake a march of three months into the centre of Asia. To be at a distance of three months from the sea-coast was a terrible idea for a Greek. Clearchus, a strict disciplinarian, a man of grim feature and harsh voice unpopular with his men, thought to repress the mutiny by severity, but the mutiny was too general to be quelled by coercion. Then he resorted to a stratagem which he carried out with admirable adroitness. Calling his soldiers together, he stood for some time weeping before he spoke. He then set forth the cruel dilemma in which their conduct had placed him. He must either break his plighted faith with Cyrus, or desert them. But he did not hesitate to choose. Whatever happened, he would stand by them, who were his country, his friends, and his allies. This speech created a favourable impression, which was confirmed when Cyrus sent to demand an interview with Clearchus, and Clearchus publicly refused to go. But the delight of the troops was changed into perplexity when Clearchus asked them what they proposed to do. They were no longer the soldiers of Cyrus, and could not look to him for pay, provisions, or help. He, Clearchus, would stand by them, but declined to command them or advise them. The soldiers, some of them in the secret confidence of their captain, discussed the difficulty, and it was decided to send a deputation to Cyrus to ask him to declare definitely his real intentions. Cyrus told the deputation that his purpose was to march against his enemy Abracomas, Persian general in Syria, who was now on the Euphrates, and offered higher pay to the Greeks, a daric and a half instead of a daric a month. The soldiers, finding themselves in an awkward pass, agreed to continue the march, reluctant, but hardly seeing any other way out of the difficulty though many of them must have shrewdly suspected that they would deal with Abracomas on the Euphrates, even as they had dealt with the hillmen of Pisidia. The march was now eastward by Adena and Mopsuestia, across the rivers Cerus and Pyramus, and then along the coast to Issus, where Cyrus found his fleet. It brought him seven hundred hoplites sent by the Lacedaemonians. Here, too, he was reinforced by four hundred Greek mercenaries, who had deserted from the service of the Persian general Abracomas, the enemy of Cyrus, who had fled to the Euphrates, instead of holding the difficult and fortified passes from Cilicia into Syria, as a loyal general of the great king should have done. So Cyrus now, with his Greek troops increased to the total number of fourteen thousand, passed with as much ease through the Syrian gates, owing to the cowardly flight of Abracomas, as he had before passed through the Cilician gates, owing to the prudent collusion of Cyanesis. The Syrian gates are a narrow pass between the end of Mount Amanus and the sea, part of the coast road from Issus to Miriandrus. At Miriandrus the Greeks bade good-bye to the sea, little knowing how many days would pass, how many terrible things befall them, before they hailed it again. They crossed Mount Amanus by the pass of Bailan, which Abracomas ought to have guarded, and in a twelve days' march, passing by the park and palace of Belisis, satrap of Syria, they reached Thapsacus, and beheld the famous Euphrates. Here a new explanation was necessary as to the object of the march, and Cyrus had at last to own that Babylon was the goal, that the foe against whom he led the army was the great king himself. 
the Greek troops murmured loudly and refused to cross the river, but their murmurings here were not like their murmurs at Tarsus, for they had guessed the truth long since, and their complaints were only designed to extort promises from Cyrus. The prince agreed to give each man a present of five minae at the end of the expedition, more than a year's pay at the high rate of a derrick and a half. But while the rest of the Greeks were making their bargain, Menon stole a march on them, inducing his own troops to cross the river first, a good example for which Cyrus would owe him and his troops particular thanks. Abracomas had burned the ships, but the Euphrates was, a very unusual circumstance at that season, shallow enough to be forded, a fact of which Abracomas was conceivably aware. The army accordingly crossed on foot, and continued the march along the left bank, an agreeable march until they reached the river Cabaras, beyond which the desert of Arabia began. A plain, Xenophon describes it, smooth as a sea, treeless, only wormwood and scented shrubs for vegetation, but alive with all kinds of beasts strange to Greek eyes, wild asses and ostriches, antelopes and bustards. The tramp through the desert lasted thirteen days, and then they reached Pylae at the edge of the land of Babylonia, fertile then with its artificial irrigation, now mostly a barren wilderness. Soon after they passed Pylae, they became aware that a large host had been moving in front, ravaging the country before them. Artaxerxes, on his part, had made somewhat tardy preparations to receive the invaders. It seems indeed to have been hardly conceived at the Persian court that the army of Cyrus would ever succeed in reaching Babylonia. The city of Babylon was protected by a double defence against an enemy approaching from the north, by a line of wall and a line of water, both connecting the Euphrates with the Tigris. The enemy would first have to pass the wall of Media, a hundred feet high and twenty feet broad, built of bricks with bitumen cement, and they would then have to cross the royal canal before they could reach the gates of Babylon. To these two lines of defence a third was now added in the form of a trench about forty miles long, joining at one end the wall of Media and at the other the Euphrates, where a space of not more than seven yards was left between the trench and the river. To defend a country so abundantly guarded by artificial fortifications, the king was able to muster immediately an army of about four hundred thousand. But this did not seem enough when the danger became imminent, and orders were sent to Media that the troops of that province should come to the aid of Babylonia. There was some delay in the arrival of these forces, and Artaxerxes probably did not wish to risk an action until their arrival had made his immense superiority in numbers overwhelming. This may explain the extraordinary circumstance that when the army of Cyrus came to the fosse which had been dug expressly to keep them out, they found it undefended and walked at their ease over the narrow passage between the trench and the river. But now it was hardly possible for Artaxerxes to let his foes advance further, though there was still no sign of the troops from the east. Two days after passing the trench, the army of Cyrus reached the village of Cunaxa, and suddenly learned that the king's host was approaching. The oriental troops under Areus formed the left wing of Cyrus, who himself occupied the centre with a squadron of cavalry. The Greeks were on the right, resting on the river Euphrates. The Persian left wing, commanded by Tissaphernes, consisted of cavalry, bowmen, and Egyptian footmen, with a row of scythe-armed chariots in front. The king was in the centre with a strong bodyguard of horse. Cyrus knew the oriental character, and he knew that if the king fell or fled, the battle would be decided, 
and his own cause won. He accordingly formed a plan of battle which would almost certainly have been successful if it had been adopted. He proposed that the Greeks should shift their position further to the left, to a considerable distance from the river, so that they might immediately attack the enemy's centre where the king was stationed. But Clearchus, to whom Cyrus signified his wishes, made decided objections to this bold and wise plan. Unable to rise like Cyrus to the full bearings of the situation, he ruined the cause of his master by pedantically or timorously adhering to the precepts of Greek drill sergeants that it is fatal for the right wing to allow itself to be outflanked. And besides the consideration which Cyrus had in view, the advantage of bringing about with all speed the flight of Artaxerxes, there was another consideration which would not have occurred to Cyrus, but which ought to have occurred to Clearchus. The safety of Cyrus himself was a matter of the first importance to the Greeks. How important we shall see in the sequel. It was useless for the Greeks to cut down every single man in the Persian left, if while they were sweeping all before them, the prince for whom they fought were slain. Cyrus did not press the matter, and left it to Clearchus to make his own dispositions. The onset of the Greeks struck their enemies with panic before a blow was struck. On the other side, the Persian right, which far outflanked the left wing of Cyrus, was wheeled round so as to take the troops of Arius in the rear. Then Cyrus, who was already receiving congratulations as if he were king on account of the success of the Greeks, dashed forward with his six hundred horse against the six thousand who surrounded Artaxerxes. The impetuous charge broke up the guard, and if the prince had kept command over his passions, he would have been the great king within an hour. But unluckily he caught sight of his brother, whom he hated with his whole soul, amid the flying bodyguard. The bitter passion of hatred overmastered him, and he galloped forward, with a few followers, to slay Artaxerxes with his own hand. He had the satisfaction of wounding him slightly with a javelin, but in the melee which ensued he was himself wounded in the eye by a carrion soldier, and falling from his horse was presently slain. The news of his death was the signal for the flight of his Asiatic troops. The vivid narrative of Xenophon, who took part in the battle, preserves the memory of these remarkable events. At the time he saw little of the battle, and he could have known little of the arrangements and movements of the Persians. But before he wrote his own book, he had the advantage of reading a book written by another Greek, who had also witnessed those remarkable events, but from the other side. This was Ctesias, the court physician, who was present at the battle and cured Artaxerxes of the breast wound which Cyrus had dealt him. The book of Ctesias is lost, but some bits of his story have drifted down to us in the works of later writers who have read it, and afford us a glimpse or two into the great king's camp and court about this eventful time. For the Greek band, which now found itself in the heart of Persia, girt about by enemies on every side, the death of Cyrus was an immediate and crushing calamity. But for Greece it was probably a stroke of good fortune, though Sparta herself had blessed the enterprise. Cyrus was a prince whose ability was well-nigh equal to his ambition. He had proved his capacity by his early successes as satrap, by the organization of his expedition which demanded an exceptional union of policy and vigor, in meeting difficulties and surmounting dangers, by his recognition of the value of the Greek soldier. Under such a sovereign the Persian realm would have thriven and waxed great, and become once more a menace to the freedom of the European Greeks. Who can tell what dreams that ambitious brain might have cherished, 
dreams of universal conquest to be achieved at the head of an invincible army of Grecian foot-lancers. And in days when mercenary service was coming into fashion, the service of Cyrus would have been popular. Whatever oriental craft and cruelty lurked beneath, he had not only a frank and attractive manner, but a generous nature, which completely won such an honest Greek as Xenophon, the soldier and historian. He knew how to appreciate the Greeks as none of his country ever knew before. He recognized their superiority to the Asiatics in the military qualities of steadfastness and discipline, and this undisguised appreciation was a flattery which they were unable to resist. If Cyrus had come to the throne, his energy and policy would certainly have been felt in the Aegean world. The Greeks would not have been left for the next two generations to shape their own destinies, as they did, little affected by the languid interventions of Artaxerxes. Perhaps the stubborn stupidity of Clearchus on the field of Cunaxa, with his hard and fast precepts of Greek drill-sergeants, saved Hellas from becoming a Persian satrapy. But such speculations would have brought little comfort, could they have occurred, to the ten thousand Greeks who, flushed with the excitement of pursuit, returned to hear that the rest of their army had been defeated, to find their camp pillaged, and then to learn on the following morning that Cyrus was dead. The habit of self-imposed discipline, which Cyrus knew so well how to value, stood the Greeks in good stead at this grave crisis, and their easy victory had given them confidence. They refused to surrender at the summons of Artaxerxes. For him their presence was extremely awkward, like a hostile city in the midst of his land, and his first object was at all hazards to get them out of Babylonia. He therefore parleyed with them, and supplied them with provisions. The only desire of the Greeks was to make all the haste they could homeward. By the road they had come it was nearly fifteen hundred miles to Sardis, but that road was impracticable, for they could not traverse the desert again unprovisioned. Without guides, without any geographical knowledge, not knowing so much as the course of the Tigris, they had no alternative but to embrace the proposal of Tissaphernes, who undertook to guide them home by another road on which they would be able to obtain provisions. Following him, but well in the rear of his troops, the Greeks passed the wall of Media and crossed two navigable canals before they reached the Tigris, which they passed by its only bridge close to Cetaci. Their course then lay northward up the left bank of the Tigris. They passed from Babylonia into Media, and, crossing the Lesser Zab, reached the banks of the Greater Zab without any incident of consequence. But here the distrust and suspicion which smouldered between the Greek and the Persian camps almost broke into a flame of hostility, and Clearchus was driven into seeking an explanation with Tissaphernes. The frankness of the satrap disarmed the suspicions of Clearchus. Tissaphernes admitted that some persons had attempted to poison his mind against the Greeks, but promised to reveal the names of the calumniators if the Greek generals and captains came to his tent the next day. Clearchus readily consented, and induced his four fellow generals, Aegeas, Menon, Proxenus, and Socrates, to go to Tissaphernes, though such blind confidence was ill-justified by the character of the crafty satrap. It was a fatal blunder, the second great blunder Clearchus had made, to place all the Greek commanders helplessly in the power of the Persian. Clearchus had been throughout an enemy of the Thessalian Menon, and it may be that he suspected Menon of treason, and that his desire to convict his rival in the tent of Tissaphernes blinded his better judgment. The five generals went with twenty captains and some soldiers. The captains and soldiers were cut down, 
and the generals were fettered and sent to the Persian court, where they were all put to death. Tissaphernes had no intention of attacking the Greek army. He had led them to a place from which it would be extremely difficult, if not impossible, to return to Greece, and he imagined that when they found themselves without any responsible commanders, they would immediately surrender. But if in the first moments of dismay the prospect seemed hopeless, the Greeks speedily rallied their courage, chose new generals, and resumed their northward march. It was the Athenian Xenophon, a man of ready speech and great presence of mind, who did most to infuse new spirit into the army, and guide it amidst the perils and difficulties which now beset it. Though he had no rank, being merely a volunteer, he was elected a general, and his power of persuasion, united with practical sense, won for him a remarkable ascendancy over the men. He tells us how, on the first dreary night after the betrayal of the generals, he dreamed that he saw a thunderbolt striking his father's house, and flames wrapping the walls about. This dream gave him his inspiration. He interpreted it of the plight in which he and his fellows were. The house was in extreme danger, but the light was a sign of hope. And then the thought was borne in on him that it was foolish to wait for others to take the lead, that it would be well to make a start himself. It was bold indeed to undertake a march of uncertain length, terribly long, without guides and with inexperienced officers, over unknown rivers and uncouth mountains, through the lands of barbarous folks. The alternative would have been to found a Greek city in the centre of Media, but this had no attraction. The hearts of all were set upon returning to the Greek world. It would be long to tell the full diary of the adventures of their retreat. It is a chronicle of courage, discipline, and reasonableness in the face of perils, which nothing but the exercise of those qualities, in an unusual measure, would have been able to surmount. Their march to the Carducian mountains, which form the northern boundary of Media, was harassed by the army of Tissaphernes, who, however, never ventured on a pitched battle. When they entered Carducia, the Greeks passed out of the Persian Empire, for the men of these mountains were independent, wedged in between the satrapies of Media and Armenia. The passage through this wild country was the most dangerous and destructive part of the whole retreat. The savage hillsmen were implacably hostile, and it was easy for them to defend the narrow precipitous passes against an army laden with baggage and fearing at every turn of the winding roads to be crushed by rocky masses which the enemy rolled down from the heights above. After much suffering and loss of life, they reached the stream of the Centrites, a tributary of the Tigris, which divides Carducia from Armenia. The news of their coming had gone before, and they found the opposite bank lined with the forces of Tiribadzus, the Armenian satrap. The Carducian hillsmen were hanging on their rear, and it needed a clever stratagem to cross the river safely. It was now the month of December, and the march lay through the snows of wintry Armenia. They had sore struggles with cold and hunger, but they went unmolested, for they had made a compact with Tiribadzus, undertaking to abstain from pillage. The direction of the march lay northwestward. They crossed the two branches of the Euphrates, and their route perhaps partly corresponded to that which a traveller follows at the present day from Tavriz to Erzurum. When they had made their way through the territories of the martial Calibes and other hostile peoples, they reached a city, a sign that at last they were once more on the fringe of civilization. It was the city of Gymnias, a thriving place which perhaps owed its existence to neighbouring silver mines. Here they had a friendly welcome, and learned with delight that they were not many days' journey south of Trapezus. 
a guide undertook that they should have sight of the sea after a five days' march. And on the fifth day they came to Mount Thekes, and when the van reached the summit a great cry arose. When Xenophon and the rear heard it, they thought that an enemy was attacking in front. But when the cry increased as fresh men continually came up to the summit, Xenophon thought it must be something more serious, and galloped forward to the front with his cavalry. When he drew near, he heard what the cry was. The sea! The sea! The sight of the sea to which they had said farewell at Miriandrus, and which they had so often despaired of ever again beholding, was an assurance of safety at last attained. The night watches in the plains of Babylonia, or by the rivers of Media, the wild faces in the Carducian mountains, the bleak highlands of Armenia, might now fade into the semblances of an evil dream. A few more days brought the army to Trapezus, to Greek soil, and to the very shore of the sea. Here they rested for a month, supporting themselves by plundering the Colchian natives, who dwelled in the hills round about, while the Greeks of Trapezus supplied a market. Here they celebrated games, and offered their sacrifices of thanksgiving to Zeus Sotia, in fulfilment of a vow they had made on that terrible night on the Zab after the loss of their generals. Ten thousand Greek soldiers dropped down from the mountains like a sudden thunderbolt from heaven, were a surprise which must have caused strange perplexity to the Greeks of the coast, to Trapezus and her sister Cerasus, and to their common mother Sinope. It was a somewhat alarming problem. More than a myriad soldiers, mostly hoplites, steeled by an ordeal of experience such as few men had ever passed, but not quite certain as to what their next step should be, suddenly knocking at one's gates. And they were not an ordinary army, but rather a democracy of ten thousand citizens equipped as soldiers, serving no king, responsible to no state, a law unto themselves, electing their officers and deciding all matters of importance in a sovereign popular assembly as it were a great moving city moving along the shores of the Euxine. What might it, what might it not do? For one thing, it might easily plant itself on some likely site within the range of Sinope's influence, and conceivably out-top Sinope herself. The ten thousand themselves thought only of home, the Aegean, and the Greek world. Could they have procured ships at once, they would not have tarried to perplex Sinope and her daughter cities. To Xenophon, who foresaw more or less dimly the difficulties which would beset the army on its return to Greece, the idea of seizing some native town like Phasis and founding a colony in which he might amass riches and enjoy power was not unwelcome. But when it was known that he contemplated such a plan, though he never proposed it, he well-nigh forfeited his influence with the army. In truth, a colony at Phasis, in the land of the Golden Fleece, founded by the practical Xenophon, might have been the best solution of the fate of the Ten Thousand. The difficulties which they had now to face were of a different kind from those which they had so successfully surmounted, demanding not so much endurance and bravery as tact and discretion. Now that they were no longer in daily danger of sheer destruction, the motive for cohesion had lost much of its strength. If we remember that the army was composed of men of different Greek nationalities brought together by chance, and that it was now united by no bond of common allegiance, but was purely a voluntary association, the wonder is that it was not completely disorganized and scattered long before it reached Byzantium. It is true that the discipline sensibly and inevitably declined, and it is true that the host dissolved itself at Heraclea into three separate bands, 
though only to be presently reunited. But it is a remarkable spectacle, this large society of soldiers managing their own affairs, deciding what they would do, determining where they would go, seldom failing to listen to the voice of reason in their assemblies, whether it was the voice of Xenophon or of another. The last stages of the retreat, from Trapezus to Chalcedon, were accomplished partly by sea, partly by land, and were marked by delays, disappointments, and disorders. It might be expected that on reaching Chalcedon the army would have dispersed, each man hastening to return to his own city. But they were satisfied to be well within the Greek world once more, and they wanted to replenish their empty purses before they went home. So they still held together, ready to place their arms at the disposal of any power who would pay them. To Pharnabazus, the satrap of the Hellespontine province of Persia, the arrival of men who had defied the power of the great king was a source of alarm. He bribed the Lacedaemonian admiral Anaxibius, who was stationed at the Bosphorus, to induce the ten thousand to cross over into Europe. Anaxibius compassed this by promises of high pay, but the troops who were admitted into Byzantium would have pillaged the city when they discovered that they had been deluded if Xenophon's presence of mind and persuasive speech had not once more saved them from their first impulse. After this they took service under a Thracian prince, Seuthes was his name, who employed them to reduce some rebellious tribes. Seuthes was more perfidious than Anaxibius, for he cheated them of the pay which they had actually earned. But better times were coming. War broke out, as we shall presently see, between Lacedaemon and Persia, and the Lacedaemonians wanted fighting men. The impoverished army of Cyrus, now reduced to the number of six thousand, crossed back into Asia and received an advance of pay. Here our interest in them ends, if it did not already end when they reached Trapezus. Our interest in all of them, at least, except Xenophon. Once and again Xenophon had intended to leave the army since its return to civilization, and he had steadfastly refused all proposals to elect him commander. But his strong ascendancy among the soldiers, and his consequent power to help them, had rendered it impossible for him on each occasion to abandon them in their difficulties. Now he was at last released, and returned to Athens with a considerable sum of money. It is probable that his native city, where his master Socrates had recently suffered death, proved uncongenial to him, for he soon went back to Asia to fight with his old comrades against the Persians. When Athens presently became an ally of Persia against Sparta, Xenophon was banished, and more than twenty years of his life were spent at Scyllus, a Triphylian village, where the Spartans gave him a home. Afterwards the sentence of exile was revoked, and his last years were passed at Athens. On a country estate near that Triphylian village, not far from Olympia, Xenophon settled down into a quiet life, with abundant leisure for literature, and composed, among other things of less account, the narrative of that memorable adventure in which Xenophon the Athenian had played such a leading part. Of the environment of his country life in quiet Triphylia, he has given a glimpse, showing us how he imprinted his own personality on the place. He had deposited in the great temple of Artemis at Ephesus a portion of a ransom of some captives taken during the retreat, to be reserved for the service of the goddess. This deposit was restored to him at Scyllus, and with the money Xenophon bought a suitable place for a sanctuary of Ephesian Artemis. A river Salinus flows through the place, just as at Ephesus a river Salinus flows past the temple, and in both streams there are fishes and shellfishes, 
but in the place at Silas there is also all manner of game. And Xenophon made an altar and a temple with the sacred money, and henceforward he used every year to offer to the goddess a tithe of the fruits of his estate, and all the citizens and neighbours, men and women, took part in the feast. They camped in tents, and the goddess furnished them with meal, bread, wine, and sweetmeats, and with a share of the hallowed dole of the sacrifice, and with a share of the game. For Xenophon's lads and the lads of the neighbours used to hunt quarry for the feast, and men who liked would join in the chase. There was game both in the consecrated estate and in Mount Foloi, wild swine and gazelles and stags. That estate has meadowland and wooded hills, good pasture for swine and goats, for cattle and horses. And the beasts of those who fare from Sparta to the Olympian festival, for the road wends through the place, have their fill of feasting. The temple, which is girt by a plantation of fruit trees, is a small model of the great temple of Ephesus, and the cypress wood image is made in the fashion of the Ephesian image of gold. Here Xenophon could lead a happy, uneventful life, devoted to sport and literature, and the service of the gods. At a casual glance the expedition of Cyrus may appear to belong not to Greek, but to Persian history, and the retreat of the Ten Thousand may be deemed matter for a book of adventures, and a digression which needs some excuse in a history of Greece. But the story of the upgoing and the homecoming of Xenophon and his fellows is in truth no digression. It has been already pointed out how vitally the interests of Hellas, according to human calculation, were involved in the issue of Cunaxa, and how, if the arbitrament of fortune on that battlefield had been other, the future of Greece might have been other too. But the whole episode, the upgoing, the battle, and the homecoming, has an importance, by no means problematical, which secures it a certain and conspicuous place in the procession of Grecian history. It is an epilogue to the invasion of Xerxes, and a prologue to the conquest of Alexander. The great king had carried his arms into Greece, and Greece had driven him back. That was a leading epoch in the combat between Asia and Europe. The next epoch will be the retribution. The Greeks will carry their arms into Persia, and Persia will fail to repel them. The success of Alexander will be the answer to the defeat of Xerxes. For this answer, the world has to wait for five generations. But in the meanwhile, the expedition of the soldiers of Cyrus is a prediction, vouchsafed, as it were, by history, what the answer is to be. Xenophon's Anabasis is the continuation of Herodotus. Xenophon and his band are the reconnoitres who forerun Alexander. And this significance of the adventure, as a victory of Greece over Persia, was immediately understood. A small company of soldiers had marched unopposed to the centre of the Persian Empire, where no Greek army had ever won its way before. They had defeated almost without a blow the overwhelming forces of the king within a few miles of his capital, and they had returned safely, having escaped from the hostile multitudes which did not once dare to withstand their spears in open warfare. Such a display of Persian impotence surprised the world and Greece might well despise the power whose resources a band of strangers had so successfully defied. No Hellenic city, indeed, had won a triumph over the barbarian, but all Hellenic cities alike had reason to be stirred by pride at a brilliant demonstration of the superior excellence of the Greek to the Asiatic in courage, discipline, and capacity. The lesson had, as we shall see, its immediate consequences. Only a year or two passed, and it inspired a Spartan king, 
a man indeed of poor ability and slight performance, to attempt to achieve the task which fate reserved for Alexander. But the moral effect of the Anabasis was lasting and of greater import than the futile warfare of Agesilaus. Considering these bearings, we shall have not said too much if we say that the episode of the Ten Thousand, though a private enterprise so far as Hellas was concerned, and though enacted beyond the limits of the Hellenic world, yet occupies a more eminent place on the highway of Grecian history than the contemporary transactions of Athens and Sparta and the other states of Greece. End of chapter 12, section 2. Recording by Graham Redman. Chapter 12, parts 3 and 4 of A History of Greece to the Death of Alexander the Great, volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Morgan Scorpion. A History of Greece to the Death of Alexander the Great, Volume 2, by John Bagnall Bury. Chapter 12, Part 3 and 4. Section 3. War of Sparta with Persia The enterprise of Cyrus had immediately affected the position and prospect of the Greek cities of Ionia. In accordance with their contract, the Spartans handed over the Asiatic cities to Persia, retaining only Abydus on account of its strategic importance. Cyrus, however, bidding for Greek support, had instigated the Ionian cities to revolt from their satrap, Tissaphernes, and to place themselves under his protection. Tissaphernes was in time to save Miletus, but all the other cities received Greek garrisons, and thus, when Cyrus disappeared into the interior of Asia, they had practically passed out of Persian control. After the defeat of Cyrus at Cunaxa, Tissaphernes returned to the Aegean coast as governor of all the districts which had been under Cyprus, and with the general title of commander of further Asia, implying supremacy over the adjacent satrapies. His first concern was to recover the Greek cities of the coast, and he attacked Syme. The Asiatic Greeks were greatly alarmed, and they sent to Sparta an appeal for her protection. The relations of Sparta to Persia were no longer the same, since the help given to Cyrus was an act of war against the king. The successful march of the Ten Thousand inspired Greece with a feeling of contempt for the strength of the Persian Empire. The opportunity of plundering the wealthy satrapies of Pharnabazus and Tissaphernes was a bait for Spartan cupidity. The prospect of gaining signal successes against Persia appealed to Spartan ambition. These considerations induced Sparta to send an army to Asia, and this army was increased by the remains of the famous Ten Thousand who, as already stated, crossed over from Thrace and entered the service of Sparta. Much might have been accomplished with a competent commander, but the general Sibron was unable to maintain discipline among his men, and the few successes achieved fell far short of Sparta's reasonable hopes. Thibron was superseded by Dercolidus, a man who had the repute of being unusually wily. Taking advantage of a misunderstanding between the two satraps, Dercolidus made a truce with Tissaphernes and marched with all his forces into the province of Pharnabazus, against whom he had a personal grudge. A recent occurrence rendered it possible for him to get into his hands the Troad, or Aeolus, as it was called, with speed and ease. The government of this region had been granted by Pharnabazus to Zenus, a native of Dardanus. When he died, leaving a widow, a son, and a daughter, Pharnabazus was about to choose another subsatrap, but the widow, whose name was Mania, presented a position that she should be permitted to fill the post which her husband had held. My husband, she argued, paid his tribute punctually, and you thanked him for it. If I do as well, why should you appoint another? If I am found unsatisfactory, you can remove me at any moment. She fortified her arguments by large presents of money to the satrap, his officers and concubines, and won her request. She gave Pharnabazus full satisfaction by her regular payments of tribute, 
and under her vigorous administration the Aeolid became a rich and well-defended land. A body of Greek mercenaries was maintained in her service, and immense treasures were stored in the strong mountain fortresses of Skepsis, Gergis, and Kebron. She even reduced some coast towns in the south of the Troad, and took part herself, like the Carian Artemisia, in military expeditions. But she had for a son-in-law an ungrateful traitor, Medius of Skepsis, whom she treated with trust and affection. In order to possess himself of her power, he strangled her, then killed her son, and laid hold of the three fortresses which controlled the district, along with the treasure. But Pharnabazus refused to recognize the murder of Mania, and sent back the gifts of Medius with the message. Keep them, until I come to seize both them and you. Life would not be worth living if I avenged not the death of Mania. As Medius was expecting with alarm the vengeance of Pharnabazus, the Spartan army appeared on the scene. Dercilidus became master of the Aeoliad without any opposition, since the garrisons of the cities did not acknowledge Medius, excepting only the forts of Skepsis, Gergis, and Kebron. The garrison of Kebron soon surrendered. At Skepsis, Medius came forth to a conference, and Dercilidus, without waiting to confer, marched up to the gates of the town so that Medius, with the power of the enemy, could do nothing but order them to be opened, and his unwilling orders likewise threw open the gains of Gergis. His own private property was restored to Medius, but all the treasures of Mania were appropriated by the Spartan general, for the property of Mania belonged to her master Pharnabazus, and was therefore the legitimate booty of the satrap's enemy. This booty supplied Dercilidus with pay for his eight thousand soldiers for nearly a year, and it was noticed that the conduct of the heroes of the Anabasis showed a signal improvement from this time forward. The Aeoliad now served the Spartans against the satrapy of Phonobazus somewhat as Decalea had served them in Attica. It was a fortified district in the enemy's country. Sparta, hoping that these successes would induce Persia to make terms and acquiesce in the freedom of the Greek cities, concluded truces with Tissaphernes and Phonobazus, and sent up ambassadors to Sessa to treat with the great king. Dercilidus, meanwhile, crossed into Europe and defended himself with restoring the cross wall which defended Sestos and the other cities of the Chersonese against the incursions of the Thracians, the inhabitants gladly furnishing pay and fruit to the army. On returning to Asia, the Spartan commander captured after a long siege the strong town of Ataneus. Then, by special orders from home, he proceeded to Caria. The Spartan overtures were heard unfavorably at Susa, for the king had been persuaded by his able satrap Pharnabazus to prosecute the war by sea. The Spartans could not cope in mere numbers with the fleet which Phoenicia and Cyprus could furnish him, but everything would depend on the commander. Here fortune played into his hands. There was an enemy of Sparta, an experienced naval officer, who was ready to compass heaven and earth to work the downfall of her supremacy. The Athenian admiral Conon, who we last saw escaping from the surprise of Aegosopotami, was burning to avenge the disgrace of that fatal day. He had found hospitality and protection at the court of Evagoras, king of the Cyprian Salamis, and through him had entered into communication with Ctesias, the Greek physician, whom we already met at Cunaza. Ctesias had the ear of the queen mother Parisatis, and through her influence and the advice of Phonobazus, Conon was appointed to command a fleet of three hundred ships, which was prepared in Phoenicia and Cilicia. Under his command, such a numerous navy was extremely formidable, but the Lacedaemonian government does not seem to have realized the danger, owing perhaps to their experience of the ineffectiveness of previous Persian armaments, and they committed the mistake of throwing all their vigor into the land warfare and neglecting their sea power, which was absolutely vital for the maintenance of their supremacy. But when Conon, not waiting for the complete equipment of the fleet, sailed to Cornus in Caria with forty ships, the Spartans were obliged to move. They sent a fleet of a hundred and twenty ships under Pharax to blockade Cornus and Conan's galleys in the harbour, and ordered Dercilidus to Caria. The joint forces of Tissaphernes and Phonobazus first raised the siege of Cornus, and then confronted Dercilidus in the valley of the Meander. A panic which seized some of the troops of the Spartan general might have been fatal, but the reputation of the ten thousand, whose valour Tissaphernes had experienced, rendered that satrap unwilling to risk a battle, and a conference issued in an armistice. 
But Sparta had now decided to conduct the war against Persia with greater vigour and on a larger scale, and Dersilidus had to make way for no less a successor than one of the Spartan kings. Agesilaus, who now comes upon the scene, had been recently raised to the regal dignity in unusual circumstances. When Lysander retired from public affairs to visit the temple of Zeus Ammon, he had neither discarded ambition nor lost his influence. He conceived the plan of making a change in the Spartan constitution which can hardly be described as less than revolutionary. The idea was that the kingship should be no longer confined to the Eurysthenid and Proclid families in which it was hereditary by law, but that the king should be elected from all Heraclids. The Spartan king was not a king in our sense of the word. He was not a sovereign. He was rather a grand officer of the state. But the scheme to make the office elective instead of hereditary was nevertheless momentous. It meant immediately that Lysander should hold the military functions which belonged to the kings, the command of the army abroad for life. He could no longer be disposed or recalled at the end of a term of office. And in the hands of a man like Lysander, this permanent office might become something very different from what it was in the hands of the ordinary Proclid or Eurysthenid. The proportion between the power of king and ephor might be considerably shifted. Lysander's project which might well have proved the first step to a sort of principate, which might have partially adapted Spartan institutions to the requirements of an imperial state. Lysander did not conceive the possibility of carrying this bold innovation by a coup d'etat. His plan was to bring religious influence to bear on the authorities, and he secretly employed his absence from Sparta in attempting to enlist the most important oracles in favour of his design. But the oracles received his proposals coldly. It sounded far too audacious. He succeeded, however, in winning over some of the Delphic priests who aided him to invent oracles for his purpose. A rumour was spread that certain sacred and ancient records were preserved at Delphi, never to be revealed until the son of Apollo appeared to claim them, and at the same time people began to hear of the existence of a youth named Silenus, whose mother vouched that Apollo was his sire. But the ingenious plot broke down at the last moment. One of the confederates did not play his part, and the oracles bearing on the Spartan kingship were never revealed. Lysander then abandoned his revolutionary idea, and took advantage of the death of King Aegis to secure the scepter for a man whom he calculated he could direct and control. The kingship descended, in the natural course, on Leotichidus, the son of Aegis, but it was commonly believed that this youth was illegitimate, being really the son of Alcibiades. There were doubts on the matter, but the suspicion was strong enough to enable the half-brother of Aegis, Agesilaus, supported by the influence of Lysander, to oust his nephew and assume the scepter. Lysander was deceived in his man. The new king was not of the metal to be the kingmaker's tool. Agesilaus had hitherto shown only one side of his character. He had observed all the ordinances of Lycurgus from his youth up, had performed all duties with cheerful obedience, had shown himself singularly docile and gentle, had never asserted or put himself forward among his fellow citizens. But the mask of Spartan discipline covered a latent spirit of pride and ambition which no one suspected. Agesilaus, though strong and courageous, was of insignificant stature and lame. When he claimed the throne, an objection was raised on the ground of his deformity, for an oracle had once solemnly warned Lacedaemon to beware of a halt rein. But like all sacred weapons, this oracle could be blunted or actually turned against the adversaries. The god did not mean, said Lysander, physical lameness, but the reign of one who was not truly descended from Heracles. Yet those Spartans who believed in literal interpretation of divine words were ill content with the preference of Agesilaus. The new king displayed remarkable discretion and policy by his general demeanour of deferential respect to the other authorities. This had the greater effect, as the kings were generally wont to make up by their haughty manners for their want of real power. Agesilaus made himself popular with everybody, and he maintained as king the simplicity which had marked his life as a private citizen. He was unswervingly true to his friends but this virtue declined to vice when he upheld his partisans in acts of injustice. Not long after his accession, a serious incident occurred which gives us a glimpse of the social condition of the Lacedaemonian state at this period, and shows that while the government was struggling to maintain its empire abroad, it was menaced at home by dangers which the existence of that empire rendered graver every year. 
Commerce with the outside world and acquisition of money had promoted considerable inequalities in wealth, and in consequence the number of peers or fully enfranchised Spartan citizens was constantly diminishing, while the class of those who had become too poor to pay their scotch to the Sicitia were proportionally growing. These disqualified citizens were not degraded to the rank of Perioeci, they formed a separate class and were named inferiors. A stroke of luck might at any moment enable one of them to pay his subscription and restore him to full citizenship. But the inferiors naturally formed a class of malcontents, and the narrow, ever narrowing oligarchy of peers had to fear that they might make common cause with the Perioeci and Helots and conspire against the state. Such a conspiracy was hatched, but was detected in its first stage through the efficient system of secret police which was established at Sparta. The prime mover seems to have been a young man of the inferior class named Synodon, of great strength and bravery. The Ethels learned from an informer that Synodon had called his attention in the marketplace to the small number of Spartans, compared with the multitude of their enemies, one perhaps in a hundred. All alike, inferiors, Neodemodes, Perioeci, Helots, were, according to Synodon, his accomplices. For here any of them talk about the Spartans, he talks as if he could eat them raw. And when Synodon was asked where the conspirators would find arms, he pointed to the shops of the ironsmiths in the marketplace, and added that every workman and husbandman possessed tools, on the grounds of information which was perhaps more precise than this. The ephors sent for Synodon, whom they had often employed on police service, and sent him on a mission of this kind, but with an escort which arrested him on the road, put him to the torture, and wrung from him the names of his accomplices. It would have been dangerous to arrest him in Sparta, and so spread the alarm before the names of the others were known. Asked why he conspired, Synodon said, I wished to be inferior to none in Sparta. He was scourged round the city, and put to death with his fellows. Recollecting the histories of other states, we cannot help wondering that an ambitious general like Lysander did not attempt to use for his own purposes this mass of discontent, into which Synodon's abortive conspiracy opens a glimpse. There was something in the Spartan air which made a peer rarely capable of disloyalty to the privileges of his own class. Section 4. Asiatic Campaigns of Agesilaus. Battle of Cnidus. It was arranged that Agesilaus should take the place of Desidilus, that he should take with him a force of two thousand Neodemodes and a military council of thirty Spartans, including Lysander. In the Spartan projects at this juncture we can observe very clearly the effect of the episode of the expedition of Cyrus and the Ten Thousand in revolutioning the attitude of Greece towards Persia and spreading the idea that Persia was really weak. The Spartan leaders seem to have regarded the lands of the great king as a field of easy conquest for a bold Greek. King Agesilaus especially, who now began to disclose the consuming quality of ambition, dreamt of dethroning the great king himself and felt no doubt that he would at least speedily deliver the Asiatic coast from Persian control. But he lived sixty years too soon, and in any case this respectable Spartan was not the man to settle the eternal question. He regarded himself as a new Agamemnon going forth to capture a new Troy, and to make the illusion of resemblance complete, he sailed with part of his army to Aulis to offer sacrifices there in the temple of Artemis, as the king of men had done before the sailing of the Greeks to Ilium. If Agesilaus had subverted the Persian Empire, the sacrifice at Aulis would have seemed an interesting instance of a great man's confidence in his own star. But the performance of Agesilaus can only provoke the mirth of history, especially as the solemnity was not successfully carried out. The Spartan king had not asked the permission of the Thebans to sacrifice in the temple, and a body of armed men interrupted the proceedings and compelled him to desist. It was an insult which Agesilaus never forgave to Thebes. Lysander expected that the real command in the war would devolve upon himself, and on arriving in Asia he acted on that assumption. He was soon undeceived. Agesilaus had no intention of being merely a nominal chief, and he checked his counsellor's several sufficiency by invariably refusing the petitions which were presented to him through Lysander. The policy was effectual. Lysander, smarting under the humiliation, was sent at his own request on a separate mission to the Hellespont, where he did useful work for Sparta. The satraps, in the meantime, had renewed with Agesilaus the truce they had made with Dercyllidus, but it was soon broken by Tissaphernes. 
Agesilaus made a feint of marching into Caria, and then suddenly, when Tissaphernes had completed his dispositions for defence, turned northwards to Phrygia and invaded the satrapy of Pharnabazus. Here he accomplished nothing of abiding importance, but secured a vast quantity of booty with which he enriched his friends and favourites. It was no temptation to himself. The historian Xenophon, who has left us a special work on the life and character of Agesilaus, tells many anecdotes of this campaign to illustrate the merits of his hero. These incidents, which bring out a, his humanity, have more than a personal interest for us. They must be taken in connection with the general fact that the Greeks of the 4th century were more humane than the Greeks of the 5th. We are told that Agesilaus protected his captives against ill usage. They were to be treated as men, not as criminals. Sometimes slave merchants, fleeing out of the way of his army, abandoned on the roadside little children whom they had bought. Instead of leaving these to perish by wolves or hunger, Agesilaus had them removed and, and given in charge to natives who were too old to be carried into captivity. But Agesilaus did not scruple to use the captives, without regard to their feelings, as object lessons for his own soldiers. At Ephesus, where the winter was passed, in drill, he conceived the idea of showing his troops the difference between good and bad training. He caused the prisoners to be put up for auction naked, that the Greek soldiers might see the inferior muscles, the white skin, and the soft limbs of the Asiatics whose body were never exposed to the weather nor hardened by regular gymnastic discipline. The spectacle impressed the Greeks with their own superiority, but it was an outrage, though not intended as such, on the captives, for while all Greeks habitually stripped for exercise, Asiatics think it a shame to be seen naked. Having organized a force of cavalry during the winter, Agesilaus took the field in spring, and gained a victory over Tissaphernes on the Pactolus, near Sardis. The general ill success of Tissaphernes was made a matter of complaint at Susa. The queen mother, Parisatis, who had never forgiven him for the part he played in the disaster of her beloved Cyrus, made all the efforts to procure his downfall, and Tithrostes was sent to the coast to succeed him and put him to death. An offer was now made by Tithrostes to Agesilaus, which it would have been wise to accept. He was required to leave Asia on condition that the Greek cities should enjoy complete autonomy, paying only their original tribute to Persia. Agesilaus could not agree without consulting his government at home, and an armistice of six months was concluded. An armistice with Tithrostes, not with Persia, for Agesilaus was left free to turn his arms against Pharnabazus. In his second campaign in Phrygia, the Spartan king was supported by a Paphlagonian prince named Otis, as well as by Spithridates, a Persian noble, whom Lysander had induced to revolt. The province was ravaged up to the walls of Daskilion, where Phonabazus resided, and the Spartan troops wintered in the rich parks of the neighbourhood, well supplied with birds and fish. The train of Phonabazus, who moved about the country with all his furniture, was captured, but a dispute over the spoil alienated the oriental allies of Agesilaus, who was the more deeply chagrined at their departure, as he was warmly attached to a beautiful youth, the son of Spithridates. The Greek occupation of Phrygia was brought to an end by an interesting scene, an interview between the Persian satrap and the Lacedaemonian general. Agesilaus arrived first at the appointed place and sat down on the grass to wait. Then the servants of Pharnabazus appeared and began to spread luxurious carpets for their master. But Pharnabazus, seeing the simple seat of Agesilaus, went and sat down beside him. They shook hands, and Pharnabazus made a speech of dignified remonstrance. I was the faithful ally of Sparta when she was at war with Athens. I helped her to victory. I never played her false like Tissaphernes, and now, for all this, you have brought me to such a plight that I cannot get a dinner in my own province save by picking up what you leave. All my parks and hunting grounds and houses you have ravaged or burnt. Is this justice or gratitude? After a long silence, Agesilaus explained that being at war with the great king, he had to treat all Persian territories hostile, but invited the satrap to throw off his allegiance and become an ally of Sparta. If the king sends another governor and puts me under him, said Pharnabazus, then I shall be glad to become your friend and ally, but now, while I hold this post of command for him, I shall make war upon you with all my strength. Agesilaus was delighted with this becoming reply. I will quit your territory at once, he said, and will respect it in future, so long as I have others to make war upon. Farewells were said, 
when Phonabazus rode away, but his handsome son, dropping behind, said to Agesilaus, I make you my guest, and gave him a javelin. Agesilaus accepted the proffered friendship, and gave in exchange the ornaments of his secretary's horse. The incident had a sequel. In later years, this young Persian, ill-treated by his brothers, fled for refuge to Greece, and did not seek in vain the protection of his guest friend Agesilaus. His success in Phrygia rendered Agesilaus more than ever disposed to attempt conquests in the interior of Asia Minor. But in the meantime he had mismanaged manners of greater moment. Before he marched against Phonabazus, he had received a message from Sparta, committing to him the supreme command by sea. The preparation of an adequate fleet was urgent. Conon, with eighty sail, the rest of the armament was not yet completed, had induced Rhodes to revolt and had captured a corn fleet which an Egyptian prince had dispatched to the Lacedaemonians. Agesilaus took measures for the equipment of a fleet of 120 triremes at the expense of the cities of the islands and coastland, but he committed the blunder of entrusting the command to Pisander, his brother-in-law, a man of no experience. After his Phrygian expedition, Agesilaus had been himself recalled to Europe for reasons which will pro presently be related. Volfarnabazus went to discharge the functions of joint admiral with Conon, who had visited Susa in person, to stimulate the Persian zeal and obtain the necessary funds. In the middle of the summer, the fleet of Conon and Pharnabazus, having left Cilician waters, appeared off the coast of the Cnidian peninsula. The numbers are uncertain, but the Persian fleet was overwhelmingly larger than that of Pisander, who sailed out from Cnidus to oppose it with desperate courage. The result could not be doubtful. Pisander's Asiatic contingents deserted him without fighting and of the rest the greater part were taken or sunk. Pisander fell in the action. The Greek cities of Asia expelled the Spartan garrisons and acknowledged the overlordship of Persia. Thus Conon, in the guide of a Persian admiral, avenged Athens and undid the victory of the Aegospotami in a battle which was almost as easily won. The maritime power of Sparta was destroyed, and the unstable foundations of her empire undermined. End of chapter 12 Parts 3 and 4